So Vic is a good friend of mine, and uh, we're here together at the Cloudera office. Vic is an entrepreneur who was previously at uh, uh, Yahoo and then Google. Now he's working on a startup. Uh, Vic Singh is in the house. Vic, we first met when you were at, uh, at Yahoo. Um, any questions? You wrote uh, Yahoo Boss on a weekend. No, was that no. delicious? <laughs> you did some work on Yahoo Boss, right? You're known for some of that work, right? Um, yeah, so uh, we had a team of uh, quite a few talented people, and uh, we had a mission to try to open up search, and, and that turned into Yahoo Boss, yeah. and it was a fun project to be a part of. Cool. Well, for the folks that don't know out there, I've known Vic for a couple months now. We've been kind of sitting next to each other here in the Cloud Air Labs office and SiliconANGLE Labs office, and Vic's working on a super secret startup, which we won't talk about, but it's very data-focused, big data, the big trend. Um, and uh, I know you're not going to talk about that, but I just want to ask you, just what's your observations on data right now? I mean, we were at the Strata conference, and obviously data, you know, a lot of people are partying with data these days in terms of playing with it and uh, using data. And, uh, you know, the social media business has been starving for ROI. We're seeing now people using data in social media. You're seeing enterprises go in and look at big data from a pure analytics standpoint to actually competitive advantage. So, you know, you've, you've worked at Yahoo, and so did Amar Awadala, the co-founder of uh, Cloudera, and... And those big companies have, have had the big data problem, and they've kind of lived through it. So what are you seeing right now in the world uh, in terms of, I know you're doing a lot of, you're tinkering around, coding away, but you know, without talking about your company, just in general market, market trends around data, what are you seeing? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, the big data problems, I mean, I think the way people think of it is this, it's this problem that is confined to just the big companies, right? Like if you're Microsoft or Yahoo yeah. or Google, and you're building an entire web search index from scratch, you're the ones who have the big data problems. And I think um, that's not necessarily true anymore. Yeah. I think uh, there's a lot of companies, uh, even like medium-sized companies and startups who are trying to tackle problems that are um, overlapping with some of the problems that are faced uh, when building solutions for big data. Um, for example, um, if you want to build kind of artificial intelligence machine learning models over even not even that large of a data set, it requires a, a considerable amount of uh, horsepower, uh, hardware to be able to do it. Um, and then as you get more and more data uh, and you want to be able to model that type of data, then you know you start running into a lot of the problems very quickly that you run into um, at some level at a, at a search company. And so I think that's becoming more of a norm rather than an exception is trying to be able to manage data. But I still think, um, there's another flip side to this as well. Um, and I think it's not like this is a surprise. I think um, a lot of companies who've been burned in the past in building solutions for big data have tried to scale out too quickly. So, um, you know, What do you mean by that? Give an example. Like, what do you mean, like, uh, scale out too quickly? In terms of, like, the sprawl of data or just coding or scaling? Or? Well, a lot of times the way their data gets generated is typically from user behavior or customer behavior. So let's think of a consumer application. And um, the only way where you get data in some of these cases is if you have a lot of consumer activity, user activity. And so, you know, when you think about, like, you know, hey, we took MySQL database and we took, you know, like some, like, basic kind of uh, programming stack and yeah, yeah. put it together, oh, it's not going to scale for more than, like, 100,000 users or something like that. And so people start to throw really fancy solutions to solving these problems very early on. You know, they start using NoSQL database systems and they start using, you know, all these different types of things to... Uh, they overbuild, them. basically. In, this, right. in a way, they overbuild and almost foreclose their capabilities, right? Yeah, I think, you know, you're saying? some of these solutions are a lot easier to use now, um, but I think um, a lot, you, you should only do it if you have those practices, right? Like, if you're not a, um, per, like, an expert about how this new data store is going to work, but you're told that this data store will scale to, you know, like a bazillion users, that's not a good enough reason to use that, especially before you have one user, right? That doesn't make sense. You should rather earn the right to scale, right? Like get get destroyed, you know, build a platform that, you know, gets destroyed and So play around, do some R and D and let's see how the data kind of reacts, if you will, kinda of like let it kind of morph or and use pieces of technology that you're familiar with. Like I think the most important thing is understanding your stack as opposed to embracing things because people told you to use it. Like a vendor you mean? Yeah, yeah I think or... like for example like you know a lot of people give like things like MySQL a hard time. And, uh, but, you know, um, or a Postgres uh, uh, SQL database. Um, but it's have tried very, and true over time, exactly. and people are using it. And it's very understandable. You know what you get. You know what the problems are. Facebook is a great example. People talk about Facebook. Right. And, you know, you have a lot of friends that, mm -hmm. that work there, and we know people that work there. 
the classic it won't scale argument we heard over and over again, but they keep on working at it. Are they, are they essentially writing their own operating system in a, in a way, aren't they? They're writing code to make it work, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for, it, it's kind of a flip of a coin um, where uh, you either, um, you can build a really nice architecture early on, uh, but you could get caught up in becoming an infrastructure company versus building a product that people are gonna use or whatever your business case is. And so in the case of Facebook, I don't think the beginning stages of how they built their company was a uh, serious problem, like using MySQL, using like PHP, that's totally fine. Um, uh, but it's better to have a problem where you could, ha you know, have enough money and revenue and users ton to of go VC money and exactly to go and reinvest and rebuild that infrastructure. Now, could they have rebuilt that at different points of time? That's more strategic. But I think in they terms did. of uh, I yeah, mean, they did right. I mean, yeah, I think there's certain questions about whether they could have done it earlier or before. Twitter is more of a, an obvious mm -hmm. fail in the market where everyone was exposed to the failure. Of their scale of the growth was massive. Yeah, and it wasn't really their fault. They built what Ruby front end and. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Kind of a easy packed back end, and then just yeah. I, I don't know too much about I don't know too much about their infrastructure, but I yeah, mean, they're, they're uh, he knows <laughs> their uh, their needs. I mean, it's I mean they successfully come out of it. I mean, Twitter's come out of it. Yeah, they, I mean, you know, and, and um, you know, they have some really good folks they brought in who I think are going to do a great job with that. But I think like um, I'd rather have that problem than the opposite problem, yeah, which where is you, no customers. You have no company and but a scalable, fantastic infrastructure <laughs> that is not battle tested. You know? What other trends are you seeing out there? So the scale out was one. Um, um, so there's there's that, and I think the other one is more um, intelligence um, around the data. So I think a lot of people go, oh, data, data, data is king, data is king, and then explaining why that is is uh, sometimes uh, missing in that story. And so I think it's up to I think startups and, and medium-sized companies to try to deliver um, the reasons as to why data is king. Um, you know, provide killer applications that literally party on the data and derive insights from that data to uh, to explain things that would have otherwise been difficult to do through a manual process. If there's companies that could do that in a way that delivers ROIs or delivers yeah. c killer consumer applications, then those are, I think, the uh, the future of, of the big data kind of world. I think that's going to be the key. The yeah, I mean, I've always said the developer kits the data now, and I wrote a post on that 2009, this hot, hot trend. I mean, literally developing with the data, mm -hmm. being a developer or like a, like coding with the data. Um, what do you think about? I mean, you're you're young. You're a little bit younger than I am by a few years. Um, there's kind of a new new breed of entrepreneurs out there. I mean, you know, when I did my first company 13 years ago, it was kind of like huge investment to start up, and, mm -hmm. and everyone kind of knows that stick now. Y Combinator is handing out free money to people, and mm -hmm. you know, there's all this kind of angel money. So, I mean, you can literally get started for you know 50k and 150k or whatever you need. It's a lot cheaper. What is the mindset of the, of the young entrepreneur right now? I mean, when I, when I say young entrepreneur, I mean like the technical entrepreneur. Come, people coming, you went to MIT, there's MIT, Stanford, you got uh, Georgia Tech, Carnegie Mellon, you know, all Princeton, all these big schools, Northeastern and Boston, you know, these big comp sci programs. What's the mindset? I mean, no fear? Are they attacking the problems differently? Mm, yeah, well, one correction, I didn't go to MIT. Um, um, but uh, I was fortunate to receive an award from them. Oh, you got an award from MIT. Yeah, um, but I was at uh, Berkeley, and that's actually where I met my uh, co-founding team. Um, and I, it's hard to generalize and know exactly what's in the minds or heads of, of folks who are starting companies these days, but I think... Um, I do... It does feel... It seems more based realistic, on, right? I mean, people yeah. aren't like... They're not putting, you know bubble mentality. You guys have seen the bubble from, from yeah. you know, college, right? And so that seeing yeah. this, uh, the, the carnage. Right. It's not a real profligate kind of environment for these young entrepreneurs. They're pretty cautious, don't you think? I, I think there are more people who, or at least in my, um, like my network, my close network, um, who are more willing to do a startup now than before. And I think uh, that's mainly because people know now that you don't need that much capital like you needed before. So the terms are a lot better these days. People can build things in the cloud and, and those costs come down considerably. And I think that's encouraging people to go do it. And I think when you have, when all your other friends are doing startups and you're the one who's not, uh, the grass is always greener right. on the other side. It's hard and to do a startup. It's it not is. easy. It's not, it's not entirely, um, uh, you know, there's definitely a lot of pros to being a larger or medium-sized organization. Um, but I think uh, that 
not knowing what's there, it, it captivates people. And the fact that they can own and control something, I think, is the uh, something that's very difficult. To what's an experience? So what's an experience that you could share with folks out there um, as an entrepreneur that you didn't expect, good and bad? Things because you came into the startup. You've had you have a, you have a good network of, of friends. You went EIR at uh, BC from Sutter Hill. Great people. You sure had certain expectations. What? Mm -hmm. What uh, things didn't you see that was a surprise for you, both good and bad, that you could share? Um, yeah, I mean, we're still very early, so I think... Um, Is it we, the freedom? Been, uh, it could be anything. Freedom, yeah, yeah. kind of... You know, so we haven't, we haven't had that many um, um, crazy ups and downs yet, and I think they're bound to happen. Uh, but based on currently what's been happening, I think uh, the, the, the thing in terms of good um, is how... I guess we were very fortunate because... Um, getting the team together, getting people to support us, um, uh, being able to get access to great resources like this, I think um, came um, rather easy to us, and we were just very fortunate to be at the right place. The right and time. And your being in the valley, and your is founding nice. team has been pretty tight. You guys worked together in the past, yeah. We're roommates, and right yeah. And I think that's really important to know who you're working with, and so um, and they're the smartest people I've ever worked with. So it always always makes yeah, it yeah. easier. Um, but I think there's that, and then yeah. the the kind of the Kind of the in terms of the negative, I think, um, is trying to, you know, it, it's something that a few folks have always told me. But like a lot of times, um, a lot of people go in and they they feel like they can have everything figured out on day one, um, and uh, that's and as much as you want to believe that you have something that is a fully proofed idea, um, you really have to go and test it. And, and it's kind of like the scientific method. If you're, you're most likely, your hypothesis is wrong. So you have to go and test and yeah. figure out why and then re No matter how smart you are, you just got to keep on testing it. You know, exactly. The thesis, right? You right. Know? And so for us, you know, we started out with a very humble proposition and we tested it out. And then we tried to incorporate the feedback and make it stronger, stronger, stronger. And um, there's a certain point where you have to kind of figure out, are you close enough to the truth? And do you think you're in a big enough market where you could go and exercise it and leverage all the capital that you've gained in terms of people and talent and money um, to go after? Is that something that you could spend like five, 10 years doing? Um, I think that is, um, and especially when you have a team and, and other people are depending on you, you want to make sure you make that decision. Um, in, in the are right you way. closer to the truth? That's really, really good advice. Next, that's really what you got to do. Is you got to test it. And you don't have a big team, so you didn't really take a lot of funding, and you guys were very kind of lean. So it's not the big resource from the big mothership. You don't have the uh, cafeteria. Yeah, the, you don't. The, 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 <laughs> the main, the main, the, the biggest, um, um, the biggest resource that you don't have a lot of is time. And so um, that's the thing that we want to kind of make sure we leverage properly. And so that's the th you're, there's always a clock ticking. Yeah, yeah. And so you kind of have to manage that well. What do you think? Uh, I know you got to get back to coding away, but <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on the cube. Yeah. And uh, by this the way, this is great. Um, Vic is the inspiration behind Silicon Academy, which is going to be coming online hopefully next quarter, which is going to be more of an educational nonprofit. And we we were talking about doing something similar and that idea came up and mm -hmm. URL was available so Vic credited with that no. uh, inspiration what was our you, you and I were talking about so you were you were there so yeah I think the, you know that's, that, that's, that's the a, history of that I think it's a cool I, I really think it's something inter interesting there and and um you know I think you know what a Khan Academy was and, and Khan Academy like, is fantastic yeah, I mean I think, it's micro education right exactly and I think more micro that, VC micro education absolutely I think something like that um more information delivered through that medium where you have just like short clips that provide a significant amount of value that can be geared towards different like uh, verticals or anything else. And, and in our case, we know we have access to a bunch of folks who understand a lot about technology. We have a lot access to people who Algorithms, know a lot compilers, about compilers, blah blah, all this different. Even tech. to the venture industry, I think if you could provide those in a, in a way where people of all ages or, or some kind of selected ages can can digest it in an easier format, the better. Because this stuff is super hard to read in a book. Yeah, you can't. And everyone, just, I, you know, you guys have books in your desk. I know, you know, the programming books. Everyone has books. And you know, when you have a problem, you need inspiration. You kind of go to a chapter. Mm -hmm. You kind of zip open a chapter and say, okay, uh, what's that code that guy wrote? Okay, oh, and you get the inspiration. You read a quick study and you're out. Mm -hmm. In and out, five minute look up and you're gone. Mm -hmm. So that kind of quick, digestible, topic-based mm -hmm. table of contents right. like YouTube video. Right, totally. You know? yeah, we're going to do a Silicon Academy coming online next quarter, I, I hope. Yeah. Got some... Uh, some folks may, may kick in some cash. If you're interested, email me and, and send us money. We'll get it online faster. Um, so, so uh, and we can do some stuff too. I know you wanted to volunteer there, but um, for the folks out there that are, you know, kicking the tires and there's a ton, everyone's always working on a start the next big idea. Um, 
What are the challenging areas that you see people really working on? There was some news that Facebook's going to, you know, ex-Facebook is going to back an AI, some AI work, and obviously AI has been an academic, uh, you know, paradigm for years and grounded in, you know, big theory. But now with the, with the web, AI looks promising, and I'm a big believer of it, but there's these big kind of technical engineering software challenges that are emerging, whether it's data, scale out. I know one of your co-founders was getting his was a master's or PhD, his PhD, at, PhD yeah. at MIT, and he took a little break, and, and we were talking about scaling out and all this, these things. What are the key areas out there that computer scientists are, are trying to crack the code on that you think are really interesting that you could uh, talk about or identify trends? Is it new algorithms? Is it new filters? Obviously, we, I was talking about Quora earlier about some of the challenges that they have around people rank right, right, and, right, right, right. and you know contextual relevance. Any yeah, yeah, no, big like, ideas you see? You know, the, the the way we've been kind of thinking about it is like there's you could go at it and try to solve um, some really interesting problem with a new algorithm, um, but I think it's like in the context of something end to end, at least for us, the way we think about it, because we're very much in the data space and we're very much in the AI space, so it hits on a lot of things here, uh, themes that you're hitting on. But I think what we're interested in is can we, we want to use these tools for the purposes of making something really, really important, simpler to use. And I think if you strive for simplicity, it creates incredible amount of complexity in order to, to get build a solution that could deliver that. And so I think striving to make um, processes that are manual um, or, or striving to make processes that are very complex and simplifying them in a way where you get 80% of the value that you got before, perhaps even much better, um, uh, by utilizing more data, by utilizing automated techniques like intelligence. Um, I think that, uh, to me, seems to be a, a common uh, uh, theme I see in some of these. And obviously, like, Cloudera has you know a hot thing right now with HBase. We were kind of playing around with it a little bit, but you know things like HBase and Hadoop. Mm -hmm. Any particular technologies popping out of the woodwork that you can see uh, entrepreneurs maybe getting behind and drafting behind, and you know behind every open source movement, whether it's Apache or you know, there's always been this ecosystem and lift behind mm -hmm. it. Do you see any things? I mean, we're talking about people, folks about Cassandra and, mm -hmm. and you know the NoSQL stuff going on. Yeah, any, I think any, the, the any NoSQL trends stuff there? is really interesting. Um, I'm still it's it's still kind of um, for us, at least, I mean, we we use the platforms that we know how to use, and so some of these things are still kind of getting embedded, and so we're letting that kind of run out. But I mean, the things that they're promising are fantastic, and they would be huge to have it in our in our platform. Um, I think, uh, in terms of things that I know well, um, I mean, my um, my friends and colleagues know a lot more about some of these other mm -hmm. platforms that you're mentioning. But I think, like, you know, if I look at something like Lucene, for example, for search. Uh, that uh, for us has been actually quite pivotal in a lot of our work and so we've built a lot of stuff around it to make it work um, you know we use things like protocol buffers and serialization formats to make it easy to communicate between different languages and to provide services really easily um, we look at things like uh, even some of these uh, machine learning libraries that are out there There's a lot of really good open source libraries but they're all fragmented they're all over the place and there's some efforts to you know if there's an Apache project there's some other projects um, that provide some of these libraries and I think there's gonna be more um, improvements and making those lots so easier. So stitching to use. those together in terms of kind of a big so well, software frameworks have been hot. Obviously, Spring Source was sold to VMware. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of kind of integration plays. Yeah, yeah I think and I think these um, open source projects are going to become more mature, and I think they're um, they're going to get more adoption because I think some of these things are still very early, um, and I think uh, a lot of it is due to the fact that these applications that we want to see in the world are, have not yet been created. I think a lot of these kind of data intelligent data mm -hmm. aware applications haven't been created, but the moment that they start to kind of take off, these platforms are going to really kind of take off as well with those because they yeah. all are all connected. Yeah, and obviously processing technology is increasing, machine learning is hot. Um, outside of your work that you're working on the startup and, and, and uh, the data stuff, outside of that, what what's really exciting you about tech these days? And you know, is it simply the the platform? What's yeah, what's getting what's getting you most excited out out there that you're seeing? Um, hmm. Mobile? Is it you know the social? Is it the uh, abundance of data? Is there anything yeah. you can say? Hey, that's really one of the coolest trends we've seen. Is it cloud? Is it? Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, for me, I'm, I've, I've always kind of operate at a at a lower level and try to. I want to be like a player where we could obviously have angles and all those things. Where whether you're helping cloud-based services or whether you're helping mobile, but provide some layer where you could provide this intelligence to these different things. That's how I kind of always have seen um, myself in that world. Um, but I think in terms of um, general trends that look really interesting. I think obviously mobiles can be really, really interesting. The wives are calling. 
<laughs> yeah, that's Linda. <laughs> Honey, I'm live. SiliconAngle.tv. Um, she wants um, to know what uh, was for dinner tonight. <laughs> um, no, I think you know something like mobile. Um, I think there's a lot left to do there. Um, I think something that's interesting is you know like I I just recently got a smartphone. So I hadn't had a smartphone before. I always had a phone that was really, really bad, a flip phone that um, could do nothing except make phone calls. And so once I got like an Android phone, and I started using it. And I had like, not, you know, like I had a browser and I could do all this great stuff and install applications. It was really fantastic. I mean, the main thing I use it for is email. Yeah. But I mean, um, the use of speech recognition is phenomenal. Yeah, it's getting a lot better. It's it's yeah. really good. swipe is really cool. It's it's really nice. Um, I think though the one thing with these kind of I mean, my take is, and, I, and there's some folks who agree, and there's a lot of folks who disagree, but like um, these application marketplaces where you go and you install these apps, um, it kind of is like the antithesis of what we learned from the web in some ways. Like, I think of these application marketplaces as kind of like AOL, right? Like, you go and you, <laughs> I was just gonna ask you, you cherry about pick AOL. what you want. Um, I was just going to ask you about AOL. Yeah, so it's like, a big content trend. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Go ahead, yeah, continue. Like, you know, you, you basically pick whatever is popular and you download it and you install it. Um, but the nice thing about the web is when you have things like, you know, links between things and you could have search engines which can um, can try to find fairness in terms of determining which ones are relevant and which ones aren't, then you can rank uh, the content so that people can find it based on need. So um, that's why I like the web because the web is very, like, for the most part, it's very democratic. You allow for these things to kind of take off on their own. People will link to things that are good, and then these search engines can go and search and rank over it very intelligently. But in the application marketplace world, you're really bound to the app market. And you know you have these apps that get put in, and if you become popular, then you're always popular. Like winners always win. And you don't, you know, I, I just feel like it's um, you have to install things. And I think you'll eventually go back into the web. I, I hope that well, more. Well, the, everyone's been talking about, about designing for mobile. I mean, that's the key experience everyone's trying to design for. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's talk about the web. Obviously, you, you know, you have a lot of experience with search with Yahoo. You were at Google. Uh, you did uh, worked with Yahoo Boss, which is open source kind of search results. And you know, you you play with delicious. When I know you on your own time, you came over and played with it, tried to make it more real time. Um, you know, now they're sunsetting delicious. But you know, the real time web is challenging. Google has a. And, and Yahoo have an you know incumbent position with the SEO market and you know advertising the way it is with the search results. Mm -hmm. And AOL buys Huffington Post this week, and they've been on a barrage. They bought TechCrunch and Gadget, a bunch of blogs, and they have now Huffington Post. But the big thing has been you know dissing these content farms. And there's been articles out in the web today about you know how machines are going to end up killing journalism. So you know being in the machine learning and AI space, you know serious need for new approaches to essentially vet um, spam blogs or mm -hmm. content farms because you know I mean not that AOL is being accused of content farms although they're they're saying they want more page views they are investing in quality I mean Huffington Post is is a very reputable organization TechCrunch has grown to uh, have a bunch of writers so you know at least AOL is putting on a good face with their content farm mm -hmm. um, but is the web getting dumbed down and What's your view on all this? Is it what's needed? You know, and it's not really getting dumbed down. It's just more and more blogs and more content fragmentation. Yeah, it's a it's, it's a search problem. It's a it's a hard problem. I think spam um, is going to be this continual fight. And as long as there's economic incentives to create spam, it's going to be created. And so um, the techniques I think are always going to get better. And and I do think search engines search engines that will last are incentivized to deal with spam. Um, in the long run, if they want to build a compelling experience for their users, they can't really find these kind of, you know, uh, give and go kind of relationships where it's okay to have some spam because of the economic benefits to get back. I, I do think that they, these companies really do try their best to uh, prevent spam. It's just a really, really hard problem. And I think it's a combination of a bunch of things. One is maybe some of these models need to work differently. Uh, maybe some of the ways the economics work need to be rethought. Maybe the way humans get involved in the process, like us in terms of labeling spam, can be um, more encouraged or something of that nature, like what Blecko's trying to do. I think um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. My, my feeling is there's going to be a lot more techniques now that, especially now that it's been like in the public yeah. um, and people are complaining about this and it's becoming a problem. I think there's kind of two things that are going to come out. One of the techniques are going to be a lot better. Um, but I think the other thing is this is going to motivate applications, like different types of applications, applications that are more vertically interested, applications that are more socially filtered. I think this might be their chance to shine because maybe these vertical 
base you can decouple filter. them and let yet have them integrate together. Yep. And the combination of the two mm -hmm. can create a filter. Exactly. Whether I think it's gesture-based friends networks, mm -hmm. closed networks, and so on. Is that what you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, I, I think this is because this stuff is becoming more of a problem, or it's becoming a problem that is being perceived as an issue to the public. That this will create more um, leeway for other applications to come in and, and provide these filters. Well, I mean, that's a problem. Everyone knows the noise level is huge on Twitter. Core recently is trying to get the social media experts out, which makes total sense from them. Mm -hmm in the sense that, you know, they don't want that noise. It's kind of like, you know, the Usenet groups, uh, to comment on my, my Facebook when I wrote about it, said, it's like, yeah, it's like Usenet when all the AOLers came in back in the day, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like the newbies and, and the, uh, I call it the people who want the free beer. Um, but you, gotta, you can't just kick them out. You've got to make room for them, right? <laughs> you know, you can't have a social app without having a social media component. Yeah, it's you a challenge, you know? Yeah, you don't want to boot out people who are doing, are using the application in a meaningful way to themselves and, and to others. Like, if they're yeah. doing it for selfish reasons that are purely economic, then that's questionable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, you don't want to, um, in, in some ways, you want to embrace the social media experts because those are the guys who actually leverage your application the most. Those are the guys who yeah. get you virality and get you the hip factor. Yeah, I think you brought up a good point, too. And the other thing about Quora that I'll comment on is my opinion is that if they start putting these, these, these things in place too early like moderators they, they could be foreclosing data that could be telling them what to do mm -hmm. um, and I had some things voted down on me from a guy I don't even know who had no context mm -hmm. to who I was mm -hmm. and what my expertise was and actually was relevant to one one topic but you know, I'm not going to complain I mean I see Quora doing some advancements uh, there and I'm not down on Quora. I think they've got a great, great young team and just got to get the product. they got a good product. I like the UI. It's pretty, they did a good job with the UI. Yeah, the content, some of the questions are fantastic. Yeah. I mean, get real experts answering. I mean, those, 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 those contents, I mean, I could literally cut and paste and they'd be, they'd be standalone blog posts. Mm -hmm. It's that high quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of those posts. Okay, with Vic Singh, we're here in the Cube, fellow Cloudera Labs member here at siliconangle.com, siliconangle.tv, and soon to be Silicon Academy. When we get that off the ground. Thanks so much.